Hello, everybody. Okay, so <clears throat> we are kind of leaving or picking up where we left off um, after the 1920s. So the 1920s was all about spending money and getting cool stuff, new technology, all that. Um, and the Great Depression is going to kind of end all that. It's kind of the opposite. So we all heard, probably you guys know about the stock market crash in 1929, um, but there's a lot more that went on besides just the stock market crashing. So we're going to talk about why the depression took place and what did we do to fix it. Okay, so um, like we said in the 1920s, it was characterized by large living, spending on wants versus needs, um, advertising, makes things like uh, appliances, fashion, movies, and music very popular, so people are spending lots of their money on this. Um, after all this crazy, awesome living that's going on in the 20s, um, we have this guy named Herbert Hoover. He's going to be elected president in 1929. He was a Republican, and he believed in what was he called rugged individualism. <clears throat> this is a philosophy that he thought people should be able to lift themselves up by their bootstraps instead of relying on the government to survive. So we'll see how that philosophy plays out in the Great Depression. So essentially, this is kind of a summary of what we're going to talk about. The Great Depression was a, let's see, let's go, my pen. Oops, that's not what I wanted. I want a pen. Okay. So the Great Depression was a product of the 1920s lifestyle. This paired with over uh, an overambitious stock market, uh, a president who believed the government should not provide direct welfare to his citizens, made the economic collapse much more uh, devastating than some believe it could have been. All right, so what caused the Great Depression? So historians don't really have one right answer. There's a lot going on. So most would agree we have the stock market crash and financial panic. We have overproduction of goods, an unequal distribution of wealth. We have different policies going on with money, and we have high tariffs and war debts. So these are going to be the five main things that I want you to know about why the Great Depression happened. So let's dive in. So monetary po uh, policy. Basically what's going on at this time, the policy um, – of the government was to have laissez-faire politics. So what laissez-faire means is a hands-off approach to economics. A guy named Adam Smith came up with this, um, and the U.S. pretty much has been doing this since the Industrial Revolution. So this hands-off means the government should not participate in the economy. You let it do its thing. So this paired with what I talked about before, what we called rugged individualism, I'm just going to put R-I, is going to kind of create this, this idea that the government shouldn't have to kind of um, mop up what the economy produces, okay? So that's one thing. All right, a big thing, the stock market crash. So we have what is called speculation. So speculation is when um, we are going to assume that the, the stock market is going to go, continue to go up and up and up. So spe these people, they're called speculators. They convince millions of people to invest their savings or loans from banks to buy stocks, which push the prices to what we call unsustainable levels. So that means it could not happen forever. So we had a really, really high stock market. It was called a bull market. And this bull market just keeps going up because people keep buying stock. Remember, a stock is... a partial ownership of a company. 
So these people keep seeing, they see the, the stock market going up and up and up and up. And they all want to get in, get in on this because the higher it goes, the more money we make, right? So people start putting their savings into stocks and they're also getting loans from banks. So this is going to be a big thing right here. Loans from banks. So people are doing, they're basically buying, buying stocks for money they don't have banking on the fact that they're going to make more money in the end. Well, the stock market crashes and everyone goes into a panic, especially because remember that buying stocks uh, with loans? This is called buying on margin. Margin pretty much means you're buying with a loan. Well, these people that are buying, that are selling these stocks on margin, they say, okay, well, I need my money back. So all these loans that people are taking to buy stocks, these guys are saying, the banks are saying, I need my money back because the, the stock market just crashed. I need that money. So pay up. Okay. Problem is the people that are supposed to pay up don't have the money because their money's gone too. So this is going to result in a ton of bank failures. Banks just don't have the money because the people, when they have this margin call, Okay, they want their money back. There's no money to be had. All right. So this is a big thing that's going to really start the depression. All right. It's not going to be the only thing. It's a big thing. All right. And um, these things, something happens called bank runs. So bank runs basically are when people hear about um, the crash, everyone wants to go and take their money out of the bank. Problem is, money, banks don't just have a lot of money. They don't have just millions and millions of dollars sitting around. They also invest in the stock market. They make money. They That's what they want to do. Banks want to make a profit. So when you put your money in a bank, that bank is going to go take your money and they're going to invest it in the stock market. They're going to make money off your money. Okay, that's the service they, that is, that is what they get out of providing you a service. So when all these people wanted their money back, they come running to the bank. That's what these, these big lines are. Everyone's trying to get to the bank, get their savings, get, get their, whatever they have in the bank. Problem is the banks don't have that money because that money is tied up in the stock market. It's not every day where every single um, member of your bank wants your, wants their money. So as we can see this cycle right here, we have a run on bank. Savers are removing their deposits, okay? People have no confidence in the, um, in the, in the system that's going on. More people want to remove their banks. The banks are short of liquidity. That means they don't have the money, all right? And basically that makes the banks go out of business, okay? They don't have any money. They kind of just, they can't provide a service anymore. All right. So another reason is because we have this thing called the Smoot Hawley tariff. A tariff is when you put a tax on um, an export of something that you are um, selling, right? So we have high tariffs, so people don't want to buy from us. And we have these war debts, all right? So remember in World War I, we signed the peace treaty, and it told Germany that it had to pay all that money back for because they are bl to blame for starting the war. Those are called reparations. Well, they don't have the money, okay? They can't, they can't print enough money to keep up with the, with the reparations that they have to pay back. So... The U.S. isn't getting the money they, they were promised from Germany, all right? So there's another reason why we don't have money coming in. We, people can't afford to export um, goods from the U.S., and we're not getting the money coming in that we were promised. All right, we also have overproduction in agriculture and industry. So as people have less money to spend, there's a less demand for products. This 
led to farmers not being able to sell their products like milk, wheat, and corn. And it also does the same thing for businesses and stores. Businesses cannot sell products, leading to massive layoffs and business closures. So here, farmers pretty much can't make their living because they can't um, sell their products. Same thing here. Business cannot thrive because they cannot um, sell their products. And it leads to even more um, bad news because we have layoffs. That means more unemployment. All right, we also have an unequal distribution of wealth. So because of the big boom of the 1920s, we have a real big unequal distribution of wealth between the rich and the poor. Um, in 1929, it is stated that the top 1% of Americans had the same wealth as the bottom 42%. That's insane. 0.1% of people in America had the same amount of money as 42% of other Americans. So this caused the depression as a majority of Americans could not afford to live comfortably for long without employment. So we had the unemployment that's going to happen. And because of that, people just can't live. Okay. Um, and then we have this thing called the Dust Bowl that's going on. So the Dust Bowl hit America um, at a time where the farmers were already hurting due to overproduction of their goods, right? We just learned that. Um, this paired with poor farming practices result in the dust ball. Basically, um, what you're supposed to do when you're a farmer, you're supposed to rotate crops in order to keep the soil fertile. So um, different crops do different things to soil. So you're supposed to kind of just, you know, um, diversify what you're, you're planting in your soil. Farmers um, in the plains of the United States stopped doing this and the soil became dry. This paired with enormous winds led to the Dust Bowl. All right. So because of the Dust Bowl, this is also a big time where people are starting to migrate. They're supposed to, starting to move out of the plains. So places like Kansas, Oklahoma, Iowa, things like that. And they're going to go find work somewhere else because they can't farm anymore. They got to do something to keep their um, families provided for. Okay. All right. So the impact, oh, sorry. So the impact of the Great Depression. So the Great Depression not only crashed the stock market at that time, but it led to over a decade of hardship for many Americans. So three main things um, come out of the Great Depression, which is massive unemployment, migration, and shanty towns. So these things became the new normal for many Americans. All right, so the first thing, the immediate cause of the Great Depression, unemployment. So <clears throat> people had little little to no money and could not buy things, store sell less, cut back production, people laid off. So we just kind of talked about that. So this exploded after the crash of the stock market. Um, many Americans began losing their homes and all of their savings. And this leads to what we call shanty towns. Shanty towns are settlements of improvised buildings known as shanties or shacks typically made of plywood, metal, sheets of plastic, and cardboard boxes. So we have unemployment. It's going to go directly to our next um, impact of the Great Depression. They're called Hoovervilles. So those shanty towns were named Hoovervilles after the president at the time, and that was Herbert Hoover. Hoover did not do much to help ease the impact of the Depression, which led to many citizens blaming their misfortunes on him. Okay, so unemployment goes directly to Hoovervilles, all right, because we're homeless. We got to find a place to live. Um, and then we have migration. So because of the, uh, the Dust Bowl and just other people that are unemployed, um, people, oh, that's supposed to be, sorry, that's supposed to be from the East Coast, from the East Coast, East Coast. All right, they're going to migrate to places like Washington State, California to find jobs to provide for their families because they're coming from here. This is where the Dust Bowl was, okay? So the Dust Bowl, they can't do anything, so they just start packing up. They pack up their bags, and they and they go, 
Okay, some migration was centered around the railroads. So people called hobos lived off this railroad system. Yeah, I know you've heard of th that word before, but this is where it started, okay? The hobos, they lived off the railroad system and they actually made communities to help each other along the way. They even had their own language to communicate along the tracks. So here's a picture of hobos. They would, you know, live on these trailer, um, the train, um, what are they called, train... Um, oh, I can't remember. I can't remember what it's called. But, you know, the things go on the train. All right. So what they, what they would do, <clears throat> like, so if we, if the a hobo knows that mm, there's like a mean dog somewhere at a stop, what they're going to do, they're going to put that little symbol somewhere, like maybe on a building that's close by okay so these hobos they know okay there's a mean dog here or same here talk religion for food here you, they, you need food go talk to this this building what they'll do it on they'll you know draw it on whatever building talk religion they'll, they'll get you food like armed man loose woman mm, woman four men man People, rich people, poor people, people who will yell at you, people who will beat you, nice people, uh, work available, uh, hold your tongue so don't go, you know, messing around with people, um, <clears throat> stuff like that. So this is basically um, how a lot of those migrants survived on the way to wherever they were going. But a lot of the hobos just liked, they just lived you know, on the railroads. All right, so this was, oh, I put this in the wrong spot. So this is a, a picture of the Hoovervilles. So H. Bills. So as you can see, they're shanty towns, right? They don't look like much. Um, see, like they're just using like old pieces of wood. Um, this is a family right here living in this little tiny box. So this is, and we said we, we call them Hoovervilles because of Herbert Hoover. All right, so America's response to the Great Depression. So this is a Hooverville, and this says Hoover's poor farm. Hard times are still hoovering over us, okay? So they definitely blamed their president for not doing enough to ease their misfortune. All right, here's a little funny meme I found. People live in Hoovervilles. Hoover, Hoover, Herbert Hoover. I'm sorry, is this some sort of peasant joke that I'm too rich to understand? So this kind of shows you, is this a good response? I mean, not really, right? So these two things are showing us, well, maybe Hoover didn't do the best job. Okay, so we'll see what, what happened. All right, so Herbert Hoover, there he is. So you've probably heard his name before because we've said it in class before. He was the head of the Food um, Administration during World War I, the guy that was saying, you know, um, grow your victory gardens for victory, all that stuff. So he was elected in 1929 as a Republican, and unfortunately the stock market crashes about seven months into his presidency. Um, publicly, he would say that he was optimistic of the economy, but he really was worried behind closed doors of what was going to happen to the country. Um, he believed in what is called rugged individualism, which is this, it's this idea that people should succeed through their own efforts, that um, you should be able to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps and make something of yourself, and the government should not have to do anything to help. Okay. He didn't believe that people should just not get any help, but he more believed that people of America should help each other. So volunteers should help each other. Business leaders that have money should, you know, do whatever they can to uplift their neighbor um, instead of using the government to uplift the citizens. Okay. So his plan for recovery was he want he called together a conference of um, the nation's biggest businessmen to find solutions of what's going on so these business leaders they pledge to keep their factories open they won't lower their wages uh, and they'll try to help ease the unemployment that's going on in america this time however all these guys broke their promises by 1931 
All right. So this forced Hoover to actually use federal funding for public works projects to stimulate the economy. So he's he, basically public works are, you know, like constructing bridges or repairing roads. At this time, it's probably making roads um, because, you know, the 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 uh, Model T uh, blew up in the 1920s. Everyone had one. So now we actually have to have concrete roads. So he's trying to create jobs to help stimulate the economy, but Hoover refused to spend the amount required to make a dent in the un unemployment rate. So he didn't go far enough in his public works projects to stimulate the economy. It's another meme I found. I know, you know who this is? It's this guy. I, ooh, I'm not good at doing Oh, 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 Patrick, yeah. When Hoover, Herbert Hoover was present, to do less, nothing. That's funny. All right. So, now we're going to talk about the New Deal. So, after Herbert Hoover, um, he basically loses his re-election in 1930, um, uh, oh, I don't remember what year. We'll see. There you go, 1933. And this guy named President or this guy named Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes president. We call him FDR today. So he made his inaugural speech on March 4th, 1933. And he began working on the economy five days later on March 9th. Okay. So he did what is called he the 100 days. So he promised that the first 100 days of his presidency, he was going to reform the economy. So what he did during this time, he passed 15 major acts to uh, address the depression and it was called the New Deal. So this New Deal focused on three things, the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. So relief, the first thing we gotta do is make sure people can live, get people jobs, right? So we need to make sure people are, can have access to food and are safe in a home. Okay, so that's relief. Then we have a second R, recovery. So we need to make sure that we're going to try to get as many jobs as we can for people in the moment. Okay, we're going to give them food as a relief, but we're going to give them a job as recovery. And then reform. Let's do some stuff. Let's pass some laws so we can make sure the Great Depression can never happen again. Okay? So those were her were his three main uh, areas of focus. And here's another little po political cartoon where it says, Stop, wait. Government is no longer the problem. It's the solution. Okay? So remember, um, we said H Hoover was the problem because he wasn't doing enough. Well, now FDR is going to make sure it's the solution. All right, so first things first. The first thing he does, he addresses the banking and stock system. So he declared a bank holiday. So banks did not open to prevent from going out of business. So they, he just said, let's just close all the banks for right now until we can figure out what's going on. So he also was really good with the American public. So he utilized the new mass media and the radio to communicate with the American people. He called this the fireside chats. So people, Americans, would gather around um, their household radio and listen to their president talk to them. So he was trying to instill confidence in the economy. All right. If you don't have consumer confidence, it doesn't matter how many laws you pass. People won't spend their money. Okay, and that's kind of what people were kind of getting on Trump for downplaying the virus. That's kind of what he was trying to do. Um, he's trying to make sure that the American public still had confidence in the U in the U.S. economy. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But FDR was doing the same thing. He's trying to make sure people have confidence in him, his programs, and in the American economy going forward. Okay, so the first thing he did, there's just a bunch of acts. I know it's going to be a lot. All right, so he, let's see how many we got going. Okay, yeah, there we go. So first thing he does, he passes the Emergency Banking Relief Act 
Um, then he also passes some um, legislation where um, the stock market is regulated by the government before it was not. Uh, it also, um, he also, this is a big one right here, the Glass-Steel Banking Act. He wanted to keep commercial banking completely separate from investment banking. Okay, so that's basically what we have today. So back then, the banks, member took your money, right? And instead of keeping it, they would invest in the in the government. And then when those people came to get their money, there was nothing left because it was all tied up in investments. Well, the Glass-Steel Banking Act makes sure that the, the bank that we put our everyday money in cannot invest. Okay, you cannot invest. There's a separate branch of investment banking where, yeah, that's where you, what you can do. But banks are no longer able to take your money and invest it without you knowing. Okay. And then the another big thing, we get the FDIC, the Fe Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And this was created by the Glass-Steel Act, and it guaranteed government insurance of bank deposits. So if you ever go to the bank, you will see the FDIC sticker, and that means um, any money you put in this bank, you will get back regardless of what happens. And that um, goes up to $250,000 per account. So... And don't worry about all this other stuff. These are the main ones that are going to happen, okay, that are, that are, that I want you to know, all right? And they definitely um, affect us today. All right, then we also have things like the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Um, this stabilized prices um, for the overproduction in the farming industry. So what they would do, they would, they, this act paid farmers not to raise the livestock, not to make crops, okay? So it gave them money because they needed money to survive to not do these things because the more they have, the less the price is going to be. So remember, supply and demand. If there's more of something and you have no demand, well, the price is going to go down because you need to sell it. So they're trying to pay farmers not to raise these, to do what they're what. They do as farmers. Um, another thing, uh, they created the National Recovery Administration. Um, basically, it made all the things of the progressive era. Remember we were talking about the progressive era? We made all the things of the progressive era like uh, minimum wage, uh, eight-hour work days, um, the creation of unions and things like that. Basically, the government guaranteed those things for sure now. Okay. All right. But then this was declared unconstitutional. So it doesn't um, really impact us today. But these are the two main things that we're, we're trying to balance, balance <clears throat> prices of things. All right. I know it's a lot of economic talk here. Okay. Um, one thing that definitely we sh should find interesting, um, the De Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA was created. Um, and this really was to help the, the rural areas of Tennessee um, to make money, okay, to give them jobs. Um, this area right here was very rural, didn't have much industry. So he created a TVA, which is going to manage natural resources. So things like the, all the different water systems that are going on here. So the TVA controls floods, they conserve, they um, create forest lands, things like that. And they're going to, because of this TVA, he, we're going to bring electricity to the rural areas. And this was, the, the, these were, this is a really rural area at that time. Okay. Um, it's still pretty rural today, you know, but it's in the mountains. They needed something. So he created the TVA, which brought electricity to the rural areas and they were able to have a better life pretty much. And it created jobs. And the TVA still ex exists today. All right. So another main feature of the New Deal is to put people back to work, right? That's the recovery part. We need to get people jobs. So he created things like the uh, CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and people um, people, uh, young men aged 18 to 25 would basically go and build things. So they built reservoirs, trails, roadways, 
um, upgraded like cabins, things like that, all over the nation. So this was the most praised public work relief program ever ever made in in the United States. So if you go to like um, cabins around here, anything with this kind of look, this text, these signs was built by the CCC. It's pretty cool. We have a lot of places in Tennessee that were built by the CCC. You, you'll be able to recognize them if you go to the park. All right. They also, we have a big one here is the Public Works Administration. So this is another thing doing the same thing, but instead of um, like con concentrated in the forest, they build other things like dams, highways, schools, uh, libraries, things like that. Um... And it's pretty much, that's the big one I want you to know here. Uh, here's some public work sites that we know about. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This was um, developed by the CCC in the 1930s. Um, and then we have the Cumberland Homesteads. Uh, this is a community in East Tennessee that was created by the federal government to help distressed farmers and coal miners. Um, this was also um, built with a CCC. So a lot was got, was done in the 1930s, okay? He got, FDR got a lot done. Um, and other things that are little well, programs that are important, uh, the WPA, okay? So what it did, it built airports, highways, public buildings, um, and spent nearly $11 billion, all right? $11 billion in all. Um, we also have the Fair Labor Standards Act, created the right to a minimum wage, time and a half, and outlawed oppressive child labor. And then we have Social Security. So Social Security is still around today. And what this did, it established a system of old age benefits for workers, benefits for victims of industrial accidents, unemployment insurance, aid for dependent mothers and children. So it's like welfare, the blind, and the physically handicapped. Okay, this one is very important because of the precedent it sets. Okay, before we didn't really have social programs to help people. People just did what they could to survive. Well, now the Social Security Act is giving, is telling us, no, the government has a responsibility to help people. Okay, so that's why the Social Security Act is important because of the precedent it sets. All right, and that's pretty much it. I know that's a lot of um, economic stuff, but go ahead, um, make sure you wrote, you know you did some notes on this. You're gonna need to use this stuff for your um, assignment that's due um, on this Sunday. So make sure you do that. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, please keep up with your work. I don't give that much, and I make it trying to make it pretty easy for you. Okay. All right. That's the end.